evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jennifer Lezek, Coordinator of Special Projects with the Adult Services Department. And on behalf of everyone at the Chicago Public Library, welcome and happy short story month. During the program tonight, we invite you to leave your questions, comments, and reflections in the chat. And we'll ask some questions during the Q&A at the end of the conversation. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Seminary Co-op. For more information on purchasing a copy of these authors' books, visit their website, semcoop.com. Thanks so much to Seminary Co-op for their support. Tonight, we celebrate Short Story Month with a very special discussion with four wonderful writers. Patricia Ann McNair, who will moderate tonight's event, has managed a gas station, served as a medical volunteer in Honduras, sold pots and pans door to door, tended bar and bread and mushrooms, and worked on the trading floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and now teaches in the English and Creative Writing Department of Columbia College, Chicago. Her acclaimed short story collection, Responsible Adults, was released in December 2020 by Cornerstorm Press. McNair's The Temple of Air received Southern Illinois University's Devil's Kitchen Readers Award and the Chicago Writers Association's Book of the Year Award. And These Are the Good Times was a Montaigne Medal finalist. Rachel Swearingen is the author of How to Walk on Water, winner of the 2018 New American Press Fiction Prize. Her stories and essays have appeared in Vice, The Missouri Review, Kenyon Review, Off Assignment, Agni, American Short Fiction, and elsewhere. She's the recipient of the 2015 Missouri Review Jeffrey E. Smith Editor's Prize in Fiction, a 2012 Rhonda Jeff Foundation Writers Award, and a 2011 Mississippi Review Prize in Fiction. In 2019, she was named one of 30 writers to watch by the Guild Literary Complex. She holds a BA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a PhD from Western Michigan University and teaches at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. Alex Poppy is the author of four works of fiction, Girl World, Moxie, and two works soon to be released, Jinwar and Other Tales from the Levant, and Duende. Girl World was named a 35 Over 35 Debut Book Award winner, First Horizon Award finalist, Montaigne Medal finalist, shortlisted for the Eric Hoffer Grand Prize, and was awarded an honorable mention in general fiction from the Eric Hoffer Awards. Her short fiction has been a finalist for Glimmer Train's Family Matters Contest, a nominee for the Pushcart Prize, and commended for the Baker Prize, among others. When she is not being thrown from the back of food truck aid, food aid trucks or dining with pistol-packing Kurdish hitmen, she writes. Kate Weisel is the author of Driving in Cars with Homeless Men, winner of the 2019 Drew Hines Literature Prize, selected by Min Jin Lee. Her fiction has appeared or is forthcoming in the Prairie Schooner, Gulf Coast, Tin House Online, Los Angeles, Re Los Angeles Review, New Ohio Review, and The Best Small Fictions 2019, among others. She is the recipient of the Poetry on the Tea Prize and the Marsha Keach Prize. She was a Carol Hawk Fiction Fellow at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and awarded scholarships at the Wesleyan Writers Conference, the Squaw Valley Writers Conference, the Juniper Institute, Writing X Writers at Tamales Bay, and Metho Valley and elsewhere. She lives in Chicago, where she teaches at Columbia College Chicago and Loyola University. Now it is my great pleasure to welcome Patty, Rachel, Alex, and Kate to the CPL virtual stage. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Alex and Rachel and Kate, it's so great to see you. And I'd like to say welcome to everybody. Thanks for being here tonight. So Stephen King once said that the short story is like a kiss in the dark from a stranger. I know that sounds a little scary. I'm sure he meant that in a good way. And I really love that comparison. I mean, think of all that it implies, a kiss in the dark from the stranger, sort of unexpectedness, sudden delight, maybe a little bit frightening, something not easily forgotten. There's nothing exactly like a kiss in the dark from a stranger and I'd venture that there's nothing quite like the short story. Short story writers often are asked to define what a short story is, and it's almost impossible for them to do it without comparing it to something else, most often the novel. A short story is a love affair, a novel is a marriage. That's what Lori Moore tells us, tells us. You know, and the novel is a great thing. A novel is a marriage, and we all, love the novel, I would imagine. We're all, we all really enjoy being engaged with the good novel. But, but the short story, the way the story starts to close as soon as it opens, that delicate balance of what to say 
what to leave out, what to put in. The way every single word in a short story has to both advance and deepen the tale. The way when you get it right, a short story rings in your ears long after you've finished writing it or reading it. The short story by its nature and its brevity, it allows room for innovation, for experimentation. Consider the iconic Hemingway six word story, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. There are microfictions like this. There's flash fiction, postcard stories, short shorts, stories told in lists and acts and segments novellas and pieces that fit on the screen of your phone in the palm of your hand. Well, let's face it, some things really should be short. I've asked my panel partners to come up with a list of things that are better short. And here are just a few of them. Directions, sermons, flights of stairs, readings, deadlines, Wedding toasts, meetings, airline flights, jogs, public introductions, bathroom cues, election cycles, bad sex, beards and sideburns, snakes. And now, you know, right now, when every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month, and so on is both long, 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 and short, 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 while we're all navigating whatever stage of lockdown or quarantine or social distancing we find ourselves in, I believe that the short story is more essential than ever. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time concentrating for extended periods in these times. I haven't read a novel straight through in more than a year or so. Short stories though, short stories have kept me company. They've kept me reading, they've kept me imagining. Stories like Alex Poppy's Road Trip in Wartime from her forthcoming and fearless Genoir and other tales from the Levant. And Rachel Swearingen's Edith Under the Streetlight from her imaginative collection, How to Walk on Water. And Kate Wiesel's Benny's Bed from her intense collection, Driving in Cars with Homeless Men. These stories have opened doors and windows to my understanding of the world. They brought fresh air into my compressed and slightly claustrophobic life in a way that I'm both needful and grateful for. So we're about to hear readings from Alex Poppy, Rachel Swearingen, and Kate Wiesel. And after that, we'll have a conversation about this art form we all practice and we hold so dear. But let me give you one more quote about this short story. George Saunders said this, when you read a short story, you come out a little more aware and a little more in love with the world around you. So let's listen to the short stories of these wonderful writers and let's all fall a little in love. Alex? Thank you, Patty. And thank you to the Chicago Public Library for having me here. I'm gonna read from room 308. In this story, the narrator who's nameless was raped by her ex-commanding officer and dishonorably discharged from the military. As a result, she's working as a student nursing aide trainee at a VA hospital and her ex-commanding officers brought in as a patient. He's got a wife named Ashley and this part of the story takes place the narrator sitting in his, um, his room. The door to the room opened. I should have jumped up and pretended that I was doing something other than sitting in the semi-darkness with the rehearsal corpse, but that Xanax had kicked in, and so I didn't. It was Miss Patty, the Tex-Mex floor nurse, who was on husband number five and therefore impossible to sur surprise. It's bath time, was all she said. And then, give me a hand. I filled a small bowl with warm soapy water and gathered some supplies. Miss Patty leaned over the bed and pulled my ex-commanding officer toward her. Get the tie, she said. I didn't want to get the tie. 
because then I might touch him. And I didn't want to see a spread of flesh that was both strong and weak at the same time. And I didn't want to be close enough to smell his dead weather smell, but I got the tie because that's what student nursing aides do. And more important, that's what Marines do. And it wasn't as bad as bringing him his coffee after he kicked my legs out from underneath me that night at Camp Geiger. Miss Patty gently laid my ex-commanding officer back against his pillows and drew the gown up past his shoulders and chest. There wasn't much left of the area below his belly button. The part that wasn't covered in plasters and bandages looked like it had been through a shark attack. Tiny beads of perspiration formed above my upper look, lip and I used my lower lip to wipe them away. Okay, Miss Patty said. She was looking at me and then, okay, handsome. And she was looking at him. We're gonna give you a little spa treatment and you can rest more comfortably during the night, even though he wasn't conscious to hear her. And then she sponged at his face and neck and chest and arms as one would a baby. I took the damp used cloths and gave Miss Patty clean ones before I rolled my ex-commanding officer onto his side so Miss Patty could clean his back. I was surprised he seemed as heavy now as when he pinned me down on the barracks floor because there was so little left of him. Is there anything else you need me to do? I asked. And when Miss Patty shook her head, I exited into the mall lit hallway. Ashley had just stepped off the elevator and was walking toward my ex commanding officer's room. Oh, you're still here. To which I said, yes. And then we stared at each other like people, two people who don't know each other and therefore have nothing to say. The whites of her eyes were hacked by tiny broken blood vessels. Well, I said and took a step around her, which she countered with weight. And then, I'm so sad, which was said so quietly that I wasn't sure if it had come from her or me. I took a truffle from my pocket and held it out to her. This might help, I said. When she didn't respond, I explained, there is an inspirational message on the inside. Ashley didn't take the candy, so I added, it tastes good too. And then lifted her hand from where it hung at the side of her body and formed her fingers into a tiny cup. It might help with the sadness. I said, as I dropped the chocolate into her palm and closed her fingers around it. I turned and walked away because I had just lied to her. Nothing eased the sadness. Thank you. And Rachel? Thanks so much, Alex. And Patty, thank you for that wonderful introduction to that. It was incredible listening to that and to the public library. I'm going to read um, the opening of a short story called Felina, um, and I'll just start here. Uh, when Felina told Arthur she could arrange a woman's hair to resemble a waterfall or a parking garage, that she could arrange fruit like a woman lounging in space, he wasn't really listening. He was distracted by her short skirt and gray fedora. He had noticed her all the way across the factory nightclub, stacking candle holders and cocktail glasses into an elaborate tower. He asked her what she was doing. That's when she told him he was looking at the next big thing. I've got ideas, she said. It would blow your mind. Arthur worked as an account executive for an investment management firm that had been sold twice in the past three years. He didn't think anything could blow his mind anymore, but he was open to the possibility. He bought her a drink and sat across from her as she cleared the table and draped it with black silk from an attache case. She made folds in the material, directed the light so it cast shadows and drew the eye past melting ice cubes to the imprint of lipstick on a glass. Most of the world takes light for granted, she said, and shadow for that matter too. He imagined the two of them in his apartment, tangled together in his sheets. He leaned back so he wouldn't seem too eager and looked around the room. It's haunted, you know, she said. Her fedora slipped back to reveal a wide forehead and black bangs. 
She had a squarish face and dark blue eyes that reminded Arthur of a Laplander princess in National Geographic. At night when they're closing up, the bartenders hear machines whirring and see women in old fashioned dresses working, she said. It used to be a textile mill. Arthur asked her about her own work, about where she grew up, about what she liked to do in the city. She answered vaguely. She'd spent part of her childhood in France. She assisted photographers here and there and sometimes dressed department store windows. She asked her own questions. Did Arthur get that complexion working under fluorescent lights? Did he believe in ghosts? Was he the, one of those people who was what he did or did what he did or did something other than he did? He took too long to answer. With another kind of woman, he would boast about his largest accounts. He would pretend he loved the thrill of the market, the ups and downs, the rushing into work before the bell. He would brag about trips to Taiwan and India, about mountain biking and hang gliding, things he hadn't done in a long time and had never enjoyed. He stared at Felina, leaned over and tipped her fedora down over her forehead and said, there's no such thing as ghosts. Felina pulled the silk off the table. That's what you think, she said. She snapped the fabric in the air and wrapped it around herself so that only her eyes peeked out. I should go, she said. Arthur followed her outside. I didn't get your number, he said, when she turned to get into the cab. In your pocket, she said, and then she was gone. Arthur felt his breast pocket. She must have slipped it in the, car, in the card when she draped fabric around his shoulders to show how folds give the impression of girth. Felina Jones, visualist, the card read in tall avant-garde letters. And Kate. Thank you. Um, thank you, Patty and Alex and Rachel, all three of whose books I read this year and whose books were so important to me. So it's, this is, feels like a gift to get to hear all you guys. And I'm gonna stay out of the sun. <laughs> um, I'm going to read a quick three page story called I'm Exaggerating. Serena wore a navy two-piece suit, sensible flats, twisted up hair, a button collar over the wrist, read the faded blah, blah, blah script. Her first flight was to Wichita, and she had asked Nico if he knew what Wichita looked like from the sky. She wanted to hurt him, for him to picture her cloud height, off the ground, 1,600 miles to the middle, untouchable. She scooped ice and twisted bottle caps, balanced her palms on headrests during dips, the aisle a tightrope. It rattled, the overheads, the ice, her fingers. Sometimes the pilot and the co-pilot looked like the cops who rapped on her door the month before. In the cockpit, their hands on the gears against the bright, complicated look of the control panel, the backs of their heads against the bright, complicated look of the sky. She cracked the front door, chain off the bolt, swollen eye, her smile across, index finger against her lip, her lip. Nico was passed out in boxers in the bedroom in a deep sleep. The cops pushed through, ignored her. I made a mistake, she said. She paced, the blood in her hair graffiti orange and stiff. Blood on the white table, sprays of droplets from huffs where her mucus went loose under the break. I'm exaggerating, she told the cops, then recognized it as something he would tell her right in her ear, like a basketball coach fighting the sideline. Get up, Nico would say. You're faking all of this. Wichita was not what she thought. Little Rock, Providence, nowhere she'd been or belonged, but all familiar. She had a day off in Spokane. Bumpy wheels of luggage by her heel, she roamed down Division Street, smokestacks spilling filth up towards an ocean-colored mountain. Janice Chaplin, Janice Joplin on a brick wall, fingers outstretched. Towards the river, the smell of spoiled milk and a sign, near nature, near perfect. Pine trees that could see inside homes and for miles. Back on the plane, she found passengers to their rows. Locked in the Clorox blue of the bathroom, she fingered her new insignia, a wing pin she wore like a crucifix into sleep. And on the dark seat, facing backward, going forward, she thought of what to do. This she thought of terminally. What was down there, what wasn't. There was no losing of a baby or liters of liquor and dust drawers. Maybe there was a lost baby, to be exact is to lie. She had enough money to run up a credit card. There was a lease, the stain of their signatures, one under the other, 
hers under his, as if he could hold her down with ink. Somewhere above Lake Superior, she heard an infant's cry. It was a saltwater gargle, as disturbing and rangy as a vocal warm-up. She walked down the aisle, nearing the sound, and found a mother dozing in the seat. She lifted the infant from the sleeping mother's arms. Her t-shirt was splotched with milk at the nipples, her slump vaguely sexual, like she'd been slipped a Mickey. Serena strode the aisle with the infant in her arms, its wail an emergency. It filled the cabin with an engine-like force, though those fat ringed thighs kicking against her stomach went nowhere. She watched as a businessman's eyes popped open. She gazed at them, felt his shock upon waking, mid-air, mid-shriek. She pawned the little one's wet head, the mask of a soft, wet scalp under her eyes, the seam of her lips by an ear the size of a bottle cap. She whispered, hey there. She whispered, don't be quiet. She whispered, keep screaming. Lovely, thank you. Thank you so much, Kate and Rachel and Alex. Very, very different stories, very different ways of telling whole lot of different voice going on from one story to another, which is another joy of the short story is that you can capture so much in just a few pages and it's never the same between not just the stories of yours and one another's, but your own stories from one story to the next. There's something different in each of them. Um, and I know that we all write short, short stories and we're fans of short stories and we read short stories, but I'm sure that you, as well as I, have had trouble convincing publishers, for instance, that short stories are, are worth their time. And sometimes readers, you know, when you tell people that you're a short story writer and they, they say, oh, I, I never read short stories. You know, I only read novels or as though there's something wrong with the short story. Um, so I wanna ask each of you then kind of a general question and you can respond to it in any way that you want to, but why the short story? then? Why the short story? And I'll start with you, Kate. I think that um, for me personally, um, I want to, um, what, oftentimes what I want to say um, is ultimately very brief. Um, and I, I really liked the quote that you had read about the stranger um, because um, I think something that's alarming about that is like, there's so much that we don't know. Um, and because the short story only allows for so much information, um, there's so much left for the reader to imagine. Um, and so I really like to like think of the reader as like somebody that I'm collaborating with. And so for me, having them um, like in possession of some information, but definitely not all of it feels more maybe I do like the strength uh, the kiss in the dark I guess because that just feels more exciting than um than telling more information than maybe my impulse would be I don't know if that answers it but absolutely it does so you prefer the kiss in the dark of the stranger to the kiss in the bright light by <laughs> the known one um yeah but that idea of we're in collaboration with the reader in, in a way in the short story that we aren't quite with uh, the longer pieces where we kind of live together for a very long time. Um, Rachel, how about you? Why the short story? I think for me, it's just, it's such an elastic form. It allows you to do so much and you can, I, I think you can get away with being more of a stylist sometimes in a short story than you can in a novel where it can get more tedious to try certain things. Um, and I don't, I, I don't know, they can be pretty architectural and just kind of fun to splash around in and, and that, that quote that you had from Laurie Moore is so perfect, you know, but it's, uh, writing short stories a little bit more like dating than, than making a strong commitment. And so if it doesn't work out, you can set it aside and then maybe even come back to it. But I don't know about the rest of you, but when I've written, you know, drafts of novels that don't work, trying to go back to them and rework them, it's so much harder than with a, with a short story. Yes, and I, I appreciate that idea of being able to be more of a stylist sometime in short stories. It is much harder to carry that off over the hundreds of pages of a novel, at least for me. So, um, Alex, how about you? Why the short story? Um, I, I agree with Kate. I like to make the, the reader work a little bit. Uh, but for me, it's more my own fatigue and then a little bit of optimism. So uh, I, I like the 
the pressure of making everything in the short story work on multiple levels as well. But definitely fatigue. I, I find it hard to sustain a narrative voice for long periods of time. I mean, I, I've done it once in a novel, um, but it was a stretch. I, I, the stories, I usually don't plot it out. And so sometimes I just don't have very much to say. And so the short story form works better. Um, the novella seems like it's even in more dire straits than the short story. So I sometimes feel like I have a little bit more to say than a short story, but not enough for a full novel. That's my fatigue. But then the optimism comes when you feel like, oh yeah, I do see a satisfying ending without saying everything in sight, just right toward that. The idea of optimism and seeing that satisfying ending before you write, have to write too much. Um, is one of the joys, I think, of, of writing short stories. And I wonder what are some of the other things that, that you like, Alex, about creating a short story, making a short story, or reading a short story? What are some of your favorite things about that process? I've, the pandemic has really changed, I think, like every aspect of my life. And I feel like my attention span has become shorter. I know it's something, as educators, we complain about with students having a shorter attention span. And, I feel I'm guilty of it as well. And since I do like to read from a, a narrative arc from beginning to end in one sitting, the short story or the novellas is, is, fits that requirement in a way that a novel doesn't. Um, also, if you don't, if it's not working, I, I don't write it, I don't write the whole thing and then go back and edit. I edit every day and I go forward very slowly. So if I only write a couple hundred words a day, like that's a good day. Uh, I know you were saying, Patty, you wrote 17,000 words when you were at Ragdale. And I was like, oh my God, that's like so many months of work. So in a short story, if it's not working, as Rachel said, you know it, I mean, you know it pretty often quick, quickly and you can, you know, then decide if you're going to abandon it or, or continue to, or for me, go back to the beginning and start again. Rachel, is there something that you like best about writing short stories or reading short stories? Well, I, I do think I love reading them. I just finished reading yours, Patty, a few days ago. Um, and I love how short stories linger with you in different ways, like those, the, the stories. And, from, and lately I've been reading story collections. So I'll read quite a few stories in a row from a single author. And that's um, a, a different kind of pleasure. As you said, that, you know, there's, there's things that you can, you can, tell the fingerprint of a of a good short storyteller you know you can kind of pick it up without even seeing their seeing that name but then there's all these differences between the different stories and like getting a range is 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 uh yeah it's really fun kate how about you are, are there things that you like best about writing the short story or about reading the short story well i think with the short story um it's almost like like the truth comes out, you, like you say something, you say enough, and like the truth is gonna come out no matter who you are or what you're doing or what you're saying or mean to say or don't say, um, there's always a truth. Um, and so like the satisfaction I think comes with like just figuring out the truth. Um, and that takes a lot of writing, looking around at the world, probing but you, you find it eventually, you find it. And the truth to me is always in the last line, which like becomes like the thesis of the short story. So like, there's almost like a perfectionist aspect to it, which is funny because like nothing I do is perfect, but it's like this like deep need to like figure it out. Um, um, and so, yeah, I guess that that process is, is really satisfying. It sounds to me like each of you are searchers as you write your short stories. You know, when you, you talk to some writers and particularly when they're working on the long form, they talk about planning and outlining or all those things that they have to do. And I know that there are plenty of novel and long form writers who are writing to search, but it seems that particularly with the short story that each of you don't necessarily know what the heck's going on or where you're gonna go with that. Is, is that true for you Rachel is that true for you not entirely I mean it's for the first draft it's like that and if I try too hard to figure something out then the story will it just won't won't I won't find that truth that Kate is talking about 
Um, and so if I over control it early on, I'm in trouble. But I, ha I often, at least early, it's not quite so much like that lately, but um, when I'm writing a story, it, I almost have to know it like a novel some, in certain stories. And, and sometimes I've got to sit down and try to outline in order to you know, make some sense of, of the mess that I've made. So um, yeah, it's, it's both. I do both. Alex, how do you go about it? Is, are you a searcher or are you a, a planner? Yeah, I'm a searcher and I have to hear it. So if I can't hear it, it's very difficult to write. But sometimes I'll just start, I'll be spurred on by something I've heard in the news and I, it's in my mind and I can't let go of it. And so I'll, I'll write about it. Or um, sometimes like I'll see a photo there. Are, one of my really good friends posted a photo of himself when he was about 18 years old. And I was like, oh my God. And I, I wrote a story because of that photo. I had had the voice and she had like spoken her first line. It was my story, Family Matters. But I wrote that story really to celebrate friendship. And at the same time, there was a New York Times article about um, very wealthy people um, um, having like uh, genetically modified um, chromosome work done to their embryo so they could genetically engineer what kind of kids they wanted to have. And so it all kind of coalesced. And in Road Trip to Wartime, I, that, I wanted to write that piece because of um, data and behavior, because of uh, something someone had told me here that I found to be kind of alarming in terms of how a government was allowing a, um, a group to come in and spy on cell phone network users. And in Jinwar, um, someone had told me about this place near my university where women dance um, and they have what looks like lays around their necks, different colored lays, but the money in the Northern, in Northern Iraq is different colors. And so the lays were how much the ladies cost. And I, I just, that was all the information I had. I, I just, I wrote to that image because I really wanted to let people know that that existed here. And um, so the story came just because I wanted, I needed to get to the image and I didn't know how it was going to get there. I really um, admire the way that you talk about how the stories start for you, the voice. I know that that's also with your novels too, that voice often comes to you first, but then these images that sort of start you down the path to it. Kate, how do you find your way into a story? I think similar to Alex, um, just collecting images and, um, and almost like spreading it out and seeing inherently how they'll connect because they will. I just have to figure out how. So maybe that's the question too, is like, how do these things connect? And, um, and yeah, so it's, it's that like mode of seeking that I'm always in. And then I heard Susan Mino said something like, it actually takes like a certain level of stupidity to be around <laughs> because you're like, huh, you're like, you're looking at something and that's how I feel often, like slightly confused always. I'm not sure like how this dynamic has happened or um, just like trying to figure out why things are the way they are. Um, so it does, I think that that just struck me as true because it does take a level of stupidity to, you have to be dumb before you figure something out. Makes sense to me. I think sometimes my students could be a little dumber than they than they start out to be when they start their <laughs> writing. Rachel, what what brings you to the page? It's it's uh, many of the things that have just been discussed, but also for me, it's often when things start to flow. It's usually because I lock into some kind of voice or a sound, or it's it's often very oral um, or like a feeling in a room atmosphere that kind of gets me moving. Uh, and if I don't if I don't have that, then sometimes it's really hard to to enter into that story space. Rachel, have you written a novel or, or are you ready? You said you've had some novel drafts. So can you talk a little bit about the process and perhaps how that differs the, for writing for short stories than novel work? I started a novel um, back in 2013 when I was in the middle of writing a lot of short stories. And that's been a really interesting process going back and forth between the two. and. I think I was, I didn't realize I was approaching the novel as a short story writer, but I was. So there's been a real education in that. Um, and um, 
uh, yeah, so that's so I've been working on it. It's almost finished now, and I've I've learned a lot about both short stories and novels, novel writing through it. But um, what what becomes of that book, I'm not sure. <laughs> Would you mind talking a little bit more about that idea that you were approaching it as a short story writer as opposed to a novelist? How you recognize that that got in your way? Yeah, I think I was going into it in a very immediate sort of way with many different characters, and so. I had a whole a cast of a, a community cast of characters, and each I would each of the pieces was being I was really conscious of making art, full arcs and turns within each sec each chapter, which had a sort of short story feeling to it with lots of dialogue in cases. I needed to slow it down in places and to find ways to not make it so episodic. Um, and so, like it, it was just if some of the pieces, especially early on, they felt like I was you know tying short stories together versus allowing chapters to kind of spool out and for the novel to get more unwieldy and not trying to control it so that it it could have like a, a, the, a novel sort of pacing. So, yeah. Yeah, that I, the unwieldiness of the novel, the big mess that it has to be before you can really tie it down, I guess that's not, you know, that, that would be a little uncomfortable to a short story writer. Kate, have you tried a longer form? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Trying. And is there a difference in your sense of working toward one or the other? No, and that's what's, I guess, what's irritating. <laughs> maybe, yeah, I, I think it's a learning curve, but also maybe there's some things that you don't have to compromise. Um, and, and that's what's weird about genre is like, it doesn't, who says that it has to be this way versus that way, maybe with, um, depending upon the story that I'm trying to tell, it can be a little bit mi a mix of both. Um, Cause I like forms that do that, that like blend. I think we're more willing to accept that sort of novel as well as the short story, you know, as short stories have been that place for experimentation over the past couple of decades, it seems, or at least a decade that there's been a lot more experimentation in the novel as well. Look at things like uh, a visit from the goon squad by Jennifer Egan and a few others too, um, and many others. Um, Silver Girl by Leslie uh, Leslie Pizak, is that her name? There's a whole lot of different forms within there that are sort of collected to make the whole story, which is quite quite lovely. Um, Alex, as you have been, because you have done the novel, the novella, the short stories, um, how do you come at each of those projects and when do you know one will be in one or another? Oh, oh goodness. I, it's all by accident. I, I feel when I'm sitting on a panel like this, I realize like, so much how I, how much I don't know. Um, I always think that they're going to be something they're not. So um, I, I, I set out to write something short because again, the fatigue sets in and I don't, I don't feel like I have the stamina sometimes to keep a voice going. Um, and then and then I, sometimes you, I, I can't tell if it's ended or if I'm just fatigued. So I'll set it down and then I'll go back to it. Although Moxie did have a satisfying ending for me, but I, you know, it took a while to get there. Um, the, the last thing I have written is a novella and it was really hard. As Rachel said, I, I couldn't hear the voice and it's really lyrical and I played with form and that was so difficult to write. It took me a very long time. Um, and then when I stumbled upon the ending, when I finished it, I was satisfied with it. Um, I, I had initially wanted that to be a novel, but it wasn't, it just, it, it wasn't, the story was done. So it was a novella. So I, I don't plan it. It just, the stories come, they tell me what they want to, themselves to be, I guess. Well, and I, one of the things that I think about, um, when I think about putting together collections, short story collections um, is that how, how they can be, if you do them right, they can almost be a novel themselves. And I don't necessarily mean the novel and stories, which is a very specific form where each novel speaks to kind of an overarching, I mean, sorry, each story speaks to sort of an overarching idea, but then they each have their own self-contained arcs within them. And they, but they, they serve almost like chapters, right? And often, Publishers will sell them like novels and try to pretend that they're chapters and not short stories. 
but a short story collection is a slightly different animal, whether they're linked in theme or whatever. And I'm wondering how each of you um, decided how you would put together your collections. Um, how did you make the determination of those things that should be in there? I'm sure that most of you have stories that didn't make it in there. How did you decide what should be in and what should be out? Rachel, can I start with you? Sure. So when I started, I had, and I was going to write a more speculative collection. I had quite a few stories that weren't very realistic and they were all dealing with art in some way. And so I, I really wanted it to work that way. But what happened was I was also writing newer stories that were grappling with other sorts of themes that were in conversation with, with some of the pieces and not others. And um, finally, I, I realized I had to winnow it down and ended up with a very small collection of stories that were all kind of playing with that line between reality and uh, imagination or fantasy. And, um, you know, and so the art thread is still in there, but it's, it's not as heavy. And I think it actually works maybe better this way. There's a little bit, there's a lot of the noir tones come through several of the, mm -hmm. of the stories. And so I had to take a lot out in order to actually find the book, a book that actually worked together. I, I didn't want to just put everything I had into one book. I think so now, what, what, sorry. I was just saying, I'd be here, curious to hear how you put yours together. This isn't about me, <laughs> but thank you. I, um, yeah, I, I kind of threw everything in the kitchen sink and then moved things around a little bit. But I, I am curious what you did with the ones that you pulled out from your collection. They're down in the basement in my office in a pile. So <laughs> that's where they are right now. <laughs> and they may find another home eventually when you have the time to sort of... Yeah, hopefully. Hey. When you put your collection together, because your collection is they're they're very dependent on one another, the stories in some ways, but they also stand entirely alone. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think when I think of like structure in a book, I think it should mimic the content and it should mimic what's happening to the characters. Um, and so what I realized working at Columbia, um, putting together my book, was that the structure of the book was like a pool table where the characters start together because that's kind of how I think of high school like all these kids are together and then they get shot out and they are hit off of each other in different experiences and that determines their trajectory and it also felt true because um, the women in my book I felt like their stories um, were each story is at the juncture of another story and you can't really tell a story about a girl who you know, is with um, somebody who's violent, has a violent boyfriend without telling another story about maybe her childhood or about another experience that she's had before or after. Um, and so it's broke into sections, but I, I like to think of it as like a moving, moving pieces. Alex, how did you decide how to put yours together? Oh, it was an accident. My Girl World was my first book, and I think those were all, all the stories I had written, except for flash fiction and this story that I didn't like. I actually took it out of the collection at the last minute. But they were themed around loss and identity and who are we after our lives are derailed kind of suddenly. And I realized that that's a theme that I'm still I'm exploring now four books later. So and maybe it's because I feel so displaced and not quite sure of my place in this world. Um, but for Jinwar, I was trying to get the, no the novella place, Jinwar. And again, people don't want novellas. And so this publisher, Kune Press, was like, I publish specifically Middle East and I publish mostly nonfiction and I publish a lot of men, but I have a big deal coming up with a major book distributor. So you as a female is useful to me. I'll fast track this book, do you have a collection? And because Girl World's publisher had gone out of business, I had the rights back. So I added a couple stories to it, but used a lot of Girl World stories that were set in the Middle East. And when I put it together, so I, I put it together kind of like, whatever, okay. But when I put it together and I read it, I, it was as Kate said, it, it, they really did form inform one another and I, it felt much more satisfying. Um, I feel like you really get a sense of this place because the stories talk about the same things from different angles. And I, so I did form a cohesive whole that was more satisfying than I could have predicted or imagined or planned for. 
Okay. Um, I, I will, I didn't mean to shortchange Rachel's question, but um, I, when I was putting together responsible adults, I was really aware. Uh, first of all, the idea of responsible adults is absolutely not really what the stories bear. <laughs> Um, most of the adults are not particularly responsible, although they're responsible for things that happen. Um, but yeah, it was this idea of theme, the theme and the idea of longing and characters who are betrayed and betray one another in various ways. Um, and really for me, it was kind of pulling most of my stories together that hadn't yet been collected and, um, and then pulling a few out and arranging, finding the way from the younger stories to the older stories. So it really was almost chronological, even though they're very, there's very little connection to them. But thank you for asking that, Rachel. I never encouraged, never considered answering a question tonight. So um, I do want to ask, though, uh, we'll ask one more. I want to ask one more question, and then we'll have an opportunity to hear from whatever questions might be coming to Jennifer from the audience. But do you have a favorite short story or a few favorite short stories? And if you could tell us why those are the ones that you either return to or think about when you think about, oh, if I could write like that, or I can't wait to read that again. Kate, what are some of your favorite short stories or your favorite short story? Yes, so I, I had been thinking about this and I think, well, I will say what a, a few of my favorite short stories are, but I think, every short story that I read and I read them often becomes my favorite short story. And I think when I was thinking about that, because you had asked, I think it speaks to the potency of what short stories can do because of that, if they're doing it well, that truth that they deliver. And when you get a dose of the truth, there's kind of nothing like it to kind of like wake you up like the George Saunders thing. And so I'm, I just, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the best short story I've ever read until I re read another one. Um, but I was, I taught the Lone Ranger and Tonto Fistfight in Heaven by Sherman Alexi, um, Spring and Fialta is so technically perfect and great. And then like Lust by Susan Mino and any Dennis Johnson short story. And I, I could go on, so I'll let other people tell me. Rachel, how about you? Well, I mean, it's a hard, very hard question, but I think Kate, you're, it's, it's so true that the story that you just read becomes your favorite story, but I was thinking about this as well. And the stories I go back to that stay in my, that stay in my mind that I bring forward for students are, uh, you know, there's some that I keep returning to. One of them is Louise Erdrich's uh, St. Marie, which is, um, you know, such a, such a great short story. Um, it's amazing. And Rick Bass's uh, A Hermit Story is one of them, like these gorgeous descriptions of the things he does in that story. You can read it over and over and over and learn something new. Um, Edward P. Jones has this fantastic story called All Aunt, All Aunt Hager's Children. And that one I think really influenced me because of the way that he mixes um, you know, uh, genre in with very highly literature, literary stories, like a detective story, but it also has a sort of biblical feel to it. Um, those are just a few, but there's so many. Yeah. Alex? I'm a big Anthony Doerr fan. I loved his River, River Nymus and Memory Wall. Um, he's, one of, he's one of my all-time favorite writers. Um, yeah, I would say Anthony Doerr is definitely my favorite writer. Mary Get Gateskill, read a lot about her, read a lot of her short stories. Um, I really like Rebecca Curtis, Hungry Self. So yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all. Um, Jennifer, you might have some questions for us. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is a great, great conversation. We do have some good questions and some good comments in the chat from uh, from the audience. Uh, one person asks, my book club is looking for fiction set in Chicago. Uh, do you have any suggestions for stories set in Chicago, either your own or others? Julia Fine's novel um, just came out and it's set in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Trying to think. Of course, Stuart Dieback, but perhaps they've already read the Stuart Dieback and also Sandra Cisneros' House on Mango Street. Um, those are two that come to mind immediately. Sasha Heyman's work. Um, oh, there's so many. There's some good collection, Chicago collections out there too. There's the, the Rust Belt anthology has quite a few in there. Um, there's uh, a, a Chicago Granta issue that has a bunch of short stories in it. Um, I think of some other Chicago just short story writers. 
Uh, Rebecca Mackay has a few, I think. Um, Joe Mino. Yeah, Joe Mino there, yeah. John McNally, you know, who happened to find Rachel's book. He has some really wonderful short story collections. Troublemakers is in the Southwest suburbs, mostly of Chicago, but also some other places. And it's a tremendous book. I use it all the time for teaching and just for my own enjoyment. And Patty, you have some short, you have some Chicago-ish stories too, don't you? Um, there are a couple in Responsible Adults that are Chicago, uh, and close to Chicago. And then my essays are all Chicago linked, so. And I have a, there's a, and two, two stories in my book that are Chicago. There's a, a collection uh, called Chicago Noir that's good too. And I read some years ago too, if you're into noir. Um, somebody asks, what advice would you give to aspiring short story writers? Read short stories, read, 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 read all the short stories you possibly can. Not just the contemporary ones, because there's all sorts of interesting things going on in contemporary work. But, you know, when I think about my favorite short stories, I think of something like Ivan, the death of Ivan Illich, you know, which is from way, way back and quite long. Chekhov, master of storytelling, um, to read those and to go to readings and be part of the community. Um, in Chicago, once we're all able to be in the same place at the same time and, and buy books of the writers that you go see read. And that just, that's good karma. <laughs> How about anybody else? I know you all sort of teach. Do you uh, have any particular key things you tell students who are aspiring short story writers? I have something that I've learned that might help if someone out there, and that is that Sometimes it's better to just write to write a new story and think of it as a revision of your last story rather than to constantly rework and revise. I am like a chronic reviser and sometimes that can be too much. It's almost better to just take what you've learned and write the next one um, and get the pages down. Um, but I don't know who needs to hear that because there's probably someone that needs to hear the opposite advice too, but <laughs> just putting that out there. I have an Octavia Butler quote on my LMS page that something like you have to write a lot of bad stuff before you write anything that's worth reading. And I frequently remind my students that, you know, I write a lot of bad stuff before anything gets saved. I would also say pay attention to what you're paying attention to because that's your point of view and nobody else has it. Um, and so Oftentimes I think when we write a short story and you're going onto the page and you feel like you have to like write something writerly or you have to like evoke something that seems super important, but, um, but like developing your sensibility means um, like figuring out what you're actually interested in. And those are the best things to write about because um, they're what matters to you. Um, so like just pay attention to what you've paid attention to, what you double took or overheard that you thought was funny or interesting or anything that stuck out to you. That's, those are all great pieces of advice. <laughs> we have a lot of uh, writing groups at the library, so uh, I'm sure we will take those into account. Uh, someone else asked, what is your favorite source to discover short stories um, other than reading collections of short stories that you can check out at the library? Where do you find short stories? Um, what journals or magazines or websites? There are a lot of, sorry. Um, there, there are a lot of journals out there that I think sometimes you can, you can find stories online for those journals. There's lists of them. We can maybe put a few in the chat. Um, and that's a good way to discover if the magazine might be something that you like. There's quite a few uh, stories that you can just read for free online. Um, and then, uh, like I like the uh, I like reading the review right now. Um, the Kenyon Review always has really great short stories. Um, Story Magazine, published right here in the Midwest, is got some wonderful stuff. Hypertext Online, a Chicago magazine, puts up lots of fiction. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> I like the push card anthologies. I think they're a great resource and I'm sure libraries have back issues as well. And add to add to that too, the best short stories 
of the you know the year's best short stories or whatever the the title of that is I, I don't think all of us would agree with all of those stories but what's really useful there when you talk about it as a resource is the in the back pages it talks about all the journals that the stories came from and the also rans you know the honorable mentions and those sorts of things so you can find out a whole lot of um, venues that you might not otherwise have stumbled on That's great. And many of those will all be available at the library too. It, you can check out through, through the library. Awesome. Um, I think that is all of the questions that we have here today. Yeah, that was it. So I want to thank you all for being here. Thanks so much to Patty, Rachel, Alex, and Kate for a wonderful discussion. Thanks to Cheryl Johnson who helped put tonight's event together. Uh, thanks to our co-sponsor, Seminary Co-op. And don't forget to visit their website at semcoop.com if you would like to purchase any of these books and uh, collections from these wonderful writers tonight. Uh, don't forget that we have many events happening, including author talks, writing workshops, book clubs, and so much more virtually at shypublive.org. And finally, if you have a friend who, enjoy, who would have enjoyed tonight's conversation but couldn't make it, don't worry. It's available for viewing on demand on Facebook and in YouTube. So go ahead and share that with anyone else who may be interested. Thank you again for being here, everyone, and have a wonderful night.